Dr. Peter Mothera. Just I would briefly love, love to know like the kind of research that you undertake on a day-to-day -day basis around this place. First of all, let me introduce you to the Institute of Primate Research, which is a biomedical primate center whose mandate is to improve human health by ethically utilizing non-human primates. In other words, we use we ethically utilize monkeys to address health problems in humans. Mm -hmm. And we do this ethically, and the reason why we do this is because uh, monkeys are very close to humans. So if you are talking about a drug or you are talking about a vaccine, the way those products will work in monkeys, I expect it to work the same way in humans. You, you mentioned that Kenya, we are far much ahead because in other countries they use like mice, guinea pigs, maybe you can just highlight on how far that Kenya now we are developing uh, in terms of research of using primates. Yeah, as I said earlier, um, we, we really appreciate the fact that the government is upscaling the investment in terms of science, science and technology. Yeah. We are lucky to have a, a climate center like this where we can do studies in uh, using monkeys. Uh, because um, most of the other institutions uh, in other parts of the world, they use uh, lower animals like uh, the rodents, like the lats and mice. But unfortunately, it is difficult to extrapolate with certainty the data or the results that you get from those raw animals mm -hmm. to humans. So in terms of um, us having access to non-human primates or the monkeys, we have an advantage mm -hmm. because most of their data, most of our data, most of our results can be extrapolated from, to humans. From that point of view. Okay. Maybe for other people out there to understand, why specifically use the baboon? Um, over the last uh, 30 years, we have been able to develop baboon as a model to study human reproductive health issues. And this is because baboons are very close to humans. If, for example, you take, you look at a female baboon, they menstruate just like human. They shed the same amount of blood. The cycle is like that of, of, of human. When you look at fertility aspects, they are like those of human. When you look at the anti-fertility mechanisms, they are very close to human. So, the way products will work in baboons, I expect it to work the same way in human. You said you work with 50, around 50 baboons. Maybe how, for one baboon, how per day? Um, but on the other hand, uh, when you look at the short run, uh, it may look expensive because, for example, the primate studies. To acquire one baboon, you are going to spend about $700, $800. And then every year, every day, you are going to spend about $6 for per diem. So if you work with about 10 baboons, which is the minimum number of animals, that any basic experiment um, okay. would require so that then we have statistically significant uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, you are looking at um, close to a million Kenya shillings. And uh, most of our experiments, we can use as many as uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 baboons. Okay. You always try and uh, resolve the human animal conflict on this. Now, the process of us acquiring animals, we collaborate with KWS because they are the regulatory authority the regulatory body that issues permits or allows right. us to go and trap the animals because all our animals are trapped from the wild and they're taken through quarantine, a process that ensures that we screen these animals against all the diseases yes. to ensure that we don't uh, bring animals that are diseased. Mm -hmm. Now, KWS advises us on the areas to go and trap the animals and these are the areas where there is serious human wildlife conflict. So in a way also we complement the government in terms of addressing the conflict between the human and the wildlife. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a reproductive health scientist and I'm currently heading the Department of Reproductive Health in this institution mm -hmm. because we have other five uh, departments. And uh, my interest is to develop products that can improve human reproductive health. And one of the products that I've been working on is called Uniplon which is a microbicidal contraceptive. And what that means is that the product that we're developing to prevent HIV infection, at the same time prevent pregnancy. This is a gel that if you apply into the human genitals, we expect it to, uh, to modulate uh, the genital region so that sperm do not survive and the HIV does not survive. Mm. That product is still at experimentation. And we have now finished the monkey studies we now want to do human clinical trials. And we are going to do this with Akakan University Hospital 
Kalen Hospital, the University of Nairobi. So that is a product that is ongoing and we expect to get the results in the near future. When you say that it is finished within uh, the monkeys, actually it was successful. We have tested this product in monkeys and we've been able to document that when you apply this product into the genital regions of the monkeys, it lowers the pH to the extent that it cannot allow fertilization to occur. In other words, it is a fully effective, reversible contraceptive in baboons. We've also done some work uh, in vitro, that is outside of the body, that demonstrates that the product works to prevent HIV uh, activities. But as I said uh, earlier, uh, we now have to do these same studies in humans, because that is what regulatory authorities demand. That if, although we know that monkeys are very close to humans, a product of na this nature must also be tested in human. We have established that the product is safe to use. So we don't have any concerns in terms, much concerns in terms of the, the safety mm -hmm. in humans. We do have, and I've been involved in uh, two other products, um, wh which are now in the market mm -hmm. after endorsement by the Pharmacy po Poison Board. And one of the products is called uh, Smogel. Smogel is a lubricant that we have developed here in partnership with a local pharmaceutical company called Universal Corporation Limited and the local uh, clinicians. And it is now in the market uh, as a lubricant. And uh, lubrication is a major uh, sexual and health problem among women. And uh, lubri dryness, lubrication is one of the requirement for people to have improved and happy sexual life. And dryness among women is a medical condition or is a medical problem that mm. women find it quite difficult to, to discuss with the uh, medical practitioners. Um, I really appreciate the GBS in this initiative because the more we talk about these issues that traditionally have been considered to be taboo, mm -hmm. the, no, the more people associate with them or lack, accept that it's um, a part of life. An issue like, for example, dryness. Vaginal dryness is a major sexual health problem. But people find it embarrassing to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And yet we know that there are, some many, there are many women who are suffering from cancer. And by the way, uh, today, the number of people who are dying of cancer are actually more than the people who die of HIV. Mm -hmm. Yet when women are put on some of these cancer drugs, they be have serious vaginal dryness to the extent that they cannot be able to walk. Uh, so they need lubricants. Mm -hmm. So the answer to demystifying sexual health and sexual problems is to discuss them openly. And that's why even the Minister of Education has been agitating for the introduction of sexual education mm -hmm. in our schools. Sure. A good example is um, I'm reading in terms of developing modern birth control methods. And yet being a Catholic, um, Catholic advocates for abstention. Mm -hmm. In science, we have clearly seen that if people don't embrace contraception, they end up having abnormally large families that they cannot be able to take care of. But if people embrace contraception, if people embrace modern methods of contraceptive, then they end up having families that they can be able to, 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 to manage. <coughs> So these challenges are there in science, but I think what is required and what is important is for people to look at them in a sober way. I'm not um, an evolutionarist, I'm not an evolution uh, scientist, and we do have people here who actually study evolution. Um, but um, I believe that there is God, and there are so many things that we see around that clearly show us that there is somebody who is beyond uh, our control, and uh, somebody who is fair, than all of us. The future of research in Kenya is, is great. Um, if you follow the higher education system in this country, we started with one or two universities mm -hmm. about uh, 15 years ago. Now we have six, seven, okay. eight public universities and a couple of um, um, private universities. If you look at the number of uh, students that are leaving, graduating from all the universities today, they are close to 100,000 or thereabout. Now, if you compare that with the time of independence or thereabout, or even say um, in the 80s, where we used to have about a thousand or so university uh, students graduating. So we have enough manpower and we just need to invest more in these uh, graduates who are leaving the universities. Now if you look at the trade over the last five years, 
and especially the National Council for Science and Technology, mm -hmm. which is the body that uh, basically governs research in this country. Uh, the government is increasing the allocation of um, funds in terms of uh, research. Um, um, I think this year the National Council for Science and Technology has almost 300 million mm -hmm. for research. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. Um, if you look again at the element of how much money we've been putting on GDP, from GDP, uh, for a long time we've been putting about 0.3% 0, 0 of our GDP into mm -hmm. research. Now we would want a situation where the government commits 1%. And this is possible because if you look at our neighbors in uh, Tanzania, Tanzania is putting 1% mm -hmm. of their GDP Towards into, research. into research, science and innovation. So the government needs to upscale the amount of money they are putting into research and innovation. And that way then we can, as researchers, we can guarantee that we can come up with products that then can help uh, the Kenyans. Reduce the cost of health. Okay. okay. When you say about local, a local product, in comparison to the other, I, I know there are a lot of uh, things that we do import from other countries. Maybe. What can you actually say about local products and local manufacturing of, of products inside of the country? No, I think one of, them, one of the challenges that we have in this country is to convert our knowledge into products. And as scientists, if we can collaborate with clinicians and then we partner with the local manufacturers, we can cut down the cost of Medicare in this country. And just mm. to give you an example, we have over 60 drug manufacturing companies in this country. Yet we import over 70% of our medical needs. Mm -hmm. So how can we bring down the cost of Medicare? These two products, if you compare the cost of those two products with the equivalent products in the market, which are all imported, then you'll actually see the cost is less than a third. Okay. So if we embrace our technologies, if we embrace our local innovations, it is possible for us to reduce the cost of Medicare in this mm. country. Okay. Okay, maybe one point that people fear about research is the cost. At what cost do you uh, do, you do your experiments? Mm. The, everything cheap is always expensive in the long run. If you look at um, the, 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 the Asian tigers, if you compare countries like Malaysia, South Korea, North Korea, we were at par at the time of independence. But you cannot compare ourselves now with them mm -hmm. because they recognized that they needed to invest in science and technology. If you just went and googled and check how many patents come from a country like Kenya, you'd be surprised that in a year we only got about two or three patents. If you compare that with those Asian Tigers countries that we were with us in terms of no, economic no. at the time of independence, no. you're looking at a, a rate of about a thousand patents every year. So I don't think that uh, research is expensive. In the short run, it may look expensive, but in the long run, it's going to be cheap. And the one good example of a country you can use is Cuba. Because um, Cuba is a country whose population is lower than Kenya. In terms of the GDP, <coughs> they are nowhere near Kenya. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you look at their medical care, it is probably one of the best in the world. And what Cubans have done is that because they have suffered blockade from the West, because of the, uh, their system of governance, they responded to this blockade by coming up with a biotech, biotechnology com manufacturing company, which is based in Havana, their capital city, mm -hmm. called Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. And this company manufactures all the medical needs for this country. And they have actually now started exporting. It. So to answer your question directly, I don't think that research is expensive. It may look expensive in the short run, but in the long run, it is. It is it. Santi Sana Daktari. Peter Mothera. And wish you all the best on a day-to-day -day basis around this place.